Matu said, uh, today I'll be talking about uh, using memory to understand what is efficient in learning and optimization. At a very simplistic level, you can think of machine learning as some kind of box. Some might call it a magical box, which harvests some impressive amount of computational power and uh, an equally impressive amount of data raining down on it. Two, two interesting things. So if machine learning is some interesting box, or some magical box, then at the heart of it, it really is optimization algorithms. These algorithms uh, are the main workhorses of modern machine learning. They are the main algorithmic tool that we use. And probably in this talk, we'll try to understand how information and computation interact for optimization. So the two most important resources here are the computational resources available and the information theoretic resources, the amount of data or other sources of information. We'll try to understand the trade-offs between these two resources in the, con in the context of continuous optimization problems. And I'll make all of this more precise, obviously, as we go on. The main metric of computational cost that I'll be looking at is the memory that the algorithm uses. So that'll be the computational resource that I'll consider throughout the talk. So traditionally in TCS, memory has been a fundamental computational resource, starting even with the Turing machine. The two most fundamental resources there are the number of operations that the Turing machine takes and the length of the tape or the memory that it uses. There's been a very long, distinguished line of work on uh, the role of memory in TCS and something like very interesting to understand just for its own sake. Seems like a very fundamental resource. At the same time, uh, memory is increasingly a very important constraint in many practical settings. This is because we often want to run our models on devices with small memory. We increasingly want larger and larger models because larger models seem to do better. So it's an interesting figure I found uh, on the internet which shows how some sense the available memory has been a bottleneck for how large of a model we can train. And every time we've had chips with more memory, practitioners have quickly developed larger models too. And obviously with these large models, we need large, large amounts of data to train them, and that requires a lot of memory to store, and access can be expensive. And more broadly, like apart from uh, these particular settings, it's just the fact that with five, six decades of Moore's law, and combined with lots of uh, software optimizations, multi-threading, parallel processing, because of all this, computation can often be very cheap. So traditionally, we're used to thinking of the number of operations that the algorithm takes as the proxy for its running time. Like often, like the two are synonymous. But in many modern settings, uh, the number of operations might itself not be a bottleneck. So in contrast, for example, to like uh, the increase in the available processing power over the last four or five decades, memory has increased much more slowly. So that's been a much more gradual increase by like a factor of 10 or 100 perhaps, rather than like a million or even more. So I found this nice article in the communication of the ACM from last year, which uh, talks about how in modern systems, memory can be the dominant performance and energy bottleneck. And data movement, because of not having enough memory and being forced to move data, you know, to access more data, or just because you cannot fit the entire model, so these kinds of data movements can be much more expensive than actually doing computation. So the actual computation can often be pretty cheap. But just data movement and having limited memory can introduce latency, and it's often the largest energy cost as well. So memory is something interesting to consider and so on. It is increasingly very important in practical settings and can determine efficiency. And the talk today will be on understanding the role of memory in learning and optimization. And in particular, trying to understand if there are trade-offs between the memory available to the algorithm and the information resources that it uses. You can measure these information resources in different ways. Two things I'll consider are the number of gradient queries or the number of data points that the algorithm takes. And an overarching theme which I'll instantiate in a few different contexts is that there seems to be like a very sharp dichotomy in the algorithmic landscape. So it seems like in general, it's not possible to significantly improve on the convergence rate of known memory efficient techniques for various optimization settings. And these known memory efficient techniques are often variants of gradient descent without using significantly more memory, which will often be quadratic memory. I don't expect this to make sense necessarily at this point, but we'll talk about this for a few different settings. It's just uh, uh, something which, uh, which will follow us through different results. So I'll talk about roughly three things. The first setting will be on uh, 
convex optimization with first order oracles, so gradient oracle, and showing lower bounds for that setting. Second one will be uh, lower bounds on optimization with a stochastic gradient oracle. Finally, I'll talk about trying to use some of these ideas to get algorithms which have better convergence to use small memory. I spend most of my time on the first one, less on the second one, even less on the third one. And I'm happy to adapt and spend more time on any of these if you, if you have questions. So you don't necessarily need to cover all of these things. So with that, I'll start with the first one. Uh, this is joint work with awesome collaborators, Annie Marston, Aaron Sitford, and Craig Valiant. This is really the prototypical uh, optimization problem. We want to minimize convex one Lipschitz functions over the unit ball. So f is a convex one Lipschitz functions. We want to minimize it over the unit ball. What the algorithm gets is access to a first order oracle. So the algorithm can make a query on any point x that it wants. The oracle will respond with the function value at that point and the gradient at that point. First algorithm that you think of is just doing gradient descent. It's the most natural thing you could do. You query a point, take a step in the direction of the negative gradient, keep doing this, you eventually converge. It's by far the most popular algorithm, this or its variance. Uh, the reason being that's very efficient. So it uses only order D computation time per query. So all you need to do is just take a lean step in the direction of the gradient. So you're working in D dimensions, only needs D time. You also only need to store one current iterate, so order D memory, you don't need to keep around any history. The query complexity can be large with respect to the desired error epsilon. So if you want to find a point which is epsilon suboptimal compared to the true minimizer, you need one over epsilon squared queries. Something that, uh, some, something that you've probably all seen. There's a suite of other techniques uh, developed for this problem. Uh, most of them are based on the ellipsoid algorithm, the variance of the cutting plane method. I won't really, I won't really say what they do because it's not so easy to describe them. Intuitively, they all do something like a high dimensional binary search. They can be much more expensive. So all of them require d squared computation time per query, more than d squared typically. They need to keep around a lot more information. They need d squared memory that they need to keep around at every time step. But with this increased uh, computational cost, they get a smaller query complexity with respect to the desired error epsilon. To find a epsilon suboptimal point, they need d log one over epsilon queries. And if you're looking at small error epsilon, this can be much better. And they're just getting a faster convergence in terms of epsilon. So the natural question to ask is if these complex algorithms are necessary. Do you need all of this complexity in order to get those fast rates? So you can ask what should be the right notion of complexity? It's not well defined on itself. Well, uh, you could measure different axes. Uh, for one, like these algorithms are just a lot more simple. Like I can describe the entire algorithm in three lines, that's it. Whereas for something like this, it's a lot more complicated and it's probably a big reason why like, these are also so much more popular, so much easier to implement and maintain. They require only order D time versus D squared time. And they require only order D memory versus D squared memory. And as I mentioned before, we will use memory as the notion of complexity here. And uh, I think it's interesting though that complexity along one axis seems to mirror complexity along different axes. This is something not just true for this problem, that seems to be true for many different problems. So things which are expensive along the memory also seem to be more expensive in terms of time or just more complex. Andrew? So what does it mean exactly order D memory per query? It seems that you need order D memory overall, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you all, all, at any point, you only need to maintain order D, yeah. And it's only order D computation time. Um, you, could, you could, for example, try to see if you can get a separation between running time between different algorithms. But any sort of unconditional separation in running time seems impossible with current techniques. It would be stronger in some sense than P versus NP. Whereas we'll see that with memory, we can actually hope to prove unconditional separations between these simple techniques and these complex techniques. So the question here really is, uh, there are some inherent trade-offs between the memory available to the algorithm measured on the x-axis here, and the information requirement uh, measured in terms of the number of first-order queries that the algorithm makes. So what are points which are algorithmically feasible here? That's all we want to ask. So now that we have this uh, figure, let's try to just plot our different algorithms to understand uh, the setup. So on one hand, we have gradient descent. 
Only D memory, D log one over epsilon memory, if you want to be careful about the log one over epsilon requirement. But uh, it takes one over epsilon squared queries in order to find an epsilon optimal solution. And D memory is also just information theoretically necessary. Solving a D-dimensional optimization problem just to store the answer, you need D memory. So anything over here is just not possible information theoretically. So this is ruled out. Then uh, we have these cutting plane ellipsoid methods. They take uh, D squared memory. Uh, again, there's a log one over epsilon factor. Uh, they get a better query complexity in terms of epsilon. They need only D log one over epsilon queries to find an epsilon optimal point. And this query complexity in itself is also known to be optimal. So information theoretically, you cannot hope to get something better than this. So everything over here is also not possible. That's known because of information theory optimization lower bounds. Yeah, Jalan? So when you say it's optimal, the gradient descent uh, doesn't depend on D, so. Yeah, so this is, uh, so this is optimal, like if you, if you look at small error. So if in terms of just dimension independent rates, like your one over epsilon squared in itself is also optimal. But what you're really looking at is like, if you look at small errors, so if you want the convergence rate in terms of epsilon, then it's known that uh, you cannot improve on this. So really the best, the lower bound that we have is that you need min of this and this. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. everywhere in, in this talk, the function class is one Lipschitz function. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm ignoring the Lipschitz constant. Everything is one Lipschitz. Yeah. <coughs> over the edge, it actually that doesn't matter. You could relax that and still get a, we show a reduction as well, that even over the, for the unconstrained problem, it just becomes harder. Just think of the L2 ball. Okay, so everything over here is not possible. Everything over here is not possible. You have these two algorithms. The green region is trivially possible. Just waste your memory, waste your queries. Yeah, Chandra? Small question. Where does like sign SGT kind of algorithm lie here? So it's again like we are only looking at like the, we are we don't even not even worrying about the log one over epsilon bit complexity, so it wouldn't make a difference. So what we want to understand is there's, there's anything in between. Can you guess some sort of best, best of both worlds? So what is known about this? Uh, there's a very influential work on information theoretic low bounds and optimization. Uh, it's been very influential in the design of the optimization algorithm, starting with work of Nemirovsky, Uden from Yelena as well. Uh, and just, there's a lot, a lot more work here. I can't really uh, write all of this, but something that's been very influential in the design of optimization algorithms, but typically focuses on the information theoretic requirements. So what if we consider computational considerations? Uh, just in terms of the memory requirements, there is a lot of work on memory bounds for streaming data in TCS. So uh, these are typically for worst case data streams. So worst case data streams, we have very strong low bounds in many different cases. In uh, all of different, lot of different work, which I'm also missing here, probably. Uh, so if you go to like, if you relax the worst case assumption, there's been this very interesting line of work on memory bounds for finite fields, which I really love. Uh, this again here, you have some distributional assumption. You're getting samples from a nice, from some distribution, but it's all over finite fields, things like parity and so on. What about uh, continuous optimization settings? Much less is known here, but I think we're starting to fill in the picture. So going back to the picture, so we want to understand if uh, there's something uh, in between these two algorithms. So what we show in this result is that, this is the following, so I'll just state, uh, state the theorem now. So there is some epsilon, which is one over poly D, and any delta in zero to 0 0.25, is that any algorithm, even if it is randomized, if it uses memory D to the 1.25 minus delta, then it must use t to the 1 plus 1.33 delta first order queries, so gradient queries, in order to find a point which is epsilon optimal. It's a bit of a mouthful, so it's probably easiest to just visualize this. So we had this plot before, we had these two algorithms, we had these two impossible regions. So what this really says is that there is a region here which is not possible for any algorithm. So uh, if you use memory less than t to the 1.25, then you cannot get the optimal query complexity. So if you want the optimal query complexity, if you want to optimize with D, poly log D, uh, poly log D queries for like any, any epsilon, uh, even if it is uh, a very small in D or quasi-polynomially small in D, then if you have less than D to the 1.25 memory, then you must use a super linear number of queries. Any questions about the statement of the result? So how large is poly? So here, like our epsilon is one by d to the five or something. Okay, and I think the lower bounds that followed, they, they also require something. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So th these are not, uh, like I'll talk about this at the end as well. Like these are not optimal in terms of like what is known about linear memory, which I think is pretty interesting. I'll talk about that a little bit in the end. Okay, so I'll give a high level overview of the proof. I've, I won't really go into the details, but um, I'll be here for the rest of the workshop. But more than welcome to talk to me more if you want. So this is roughly three steps. First, we want to construct a distribution over functions that seems hard to optimize with limited memory. Then we want to relate optimizing these functions to winning a particular communication game. And then we'll show a hardness for this communication game, trade-offs for this game. So let me just begin by describing the function class. So here's what it looks like. So uh, this function f that you want to minimize, uh, it's uh, composed of two different terms. So it's a max of two things. The first term is the L infinity norm of Ax. And uh, a, this is a distribution over class of functions. A will be sampled uniformly at random. It has d over two rows, d columns. The second term, uh, the specific form is not so important unless you've already seen something like this. Uh, it's a variant of what's known as the Nemirovsky function. Things like this are used for showing lower bounds and optimization theory. Uh, essentially, you have a bunch of vectors, and the goal of the algorithm in order to minimize this function should be to get a negative inner product with all of them. And these vectors, vi's, these will also be sampled uniformly at random. So that's the distribution. So what's the intuition behind this? Like at a very high level, these two functions are trying to do two things. First, because of the first term, we can show that in order to read, receive any information about the second function, you must make queries which are sufficiently orthogonal to the rows of A. So we have this term here. We'll choose eta and rho suitably. So think of eta as being very large, such that in order to, uh, in order to get any information about edge, you first need to make sure that your AXL infinity norm is very small. So the inner product with every row of A is very small. So this first function acts as a kind of barrier to prevent you from getting information about H unless you make queries which are very orthogonal. And the second function, uh, this uh, Nemirovsky function, has this property that you cannot successfully minimize this function if you stick to a lower dimensional subspace. So the algorithm cannot make queries which cover only a very low dimensional subspace and hope to get information, enough information to minimize the function. So in order to continue receiving some useful information about this function, your queries must span a high dimensional subspace. And they must do this robustly in a way that I'll mention later. And the idea is that, so now in order to minimize this overall function, you need to make a lot of queries, which are first orthogonal to the rows of uh, A. So they have to be in the null space of this matrix. And two, they have to be sufficiently high dimensional. So essentially, you would have to explore a high dimensional subspace within the null space of A. And we show that this is hard by showing a reduction to a communication game. So we show that we can relate optimizing this function class to winning uh, a communication game, which we call the orthogonal vector game. So this, this I think, uh, is a useful primitive for showing these lower bounds, and it's been used in some subsequent work as well. And I'll, so, I'll, so I'll talk about this a little bit more. Any questions before I do that? OK, so let me talk about this game. So again, this will be like a sort of self-sufficient part. So here's what the game is. It's a game between two parties. So there's a player, and there's an oracle. It involves a random matrix A, which is sampled against the same distribution what I said before. D over two rows, D columns. The goal of this player, Alice, will be to find a bunch of vectors which are roughly orthogonal to the rows of A. So in order to give, win the game, Alice needs to find K vectors, Y1 through YK, which are all roughly orthogonal to A. This is, I'll um, make this a little bit more formal later. As here are some parameters of the game. Again, don't worry so much about this for now. But the, game, the way the game works is the following. So her goal is to find vectors which are orthogonal to A. So in the beginning, she gets to look at this matrix A, stare at it as far as long as she likes, and then she can write an m-bit message about this matrix A. So she can write whatever she thinks will be useful for her in order to find rows which are orthogonal to A. So obviously now if m, the number of bits in this message, is more than d times k, 
then she can just look at this matrix and write k vectors which are orthogonal to the rows of A. So they just write k vectors in the kernel because each of these vectors is d-dimensional, it takes roughly dk memory to write them. So if she had dk memory, then she'd be done. But we'd want to say something when she doesn't have as much memory. So the way the game works is that once, once she has this message, then uh, she can no longer look at the matrix A for free anymore. So the matrix A goes away. But she can make queries to this oracle. This oracle is a helpful oracle. The oracle tries to help her find uh, vectors which are orthogonal to A. So she can make any query x1. And the oracle will respond with the row of A which has the largest inner product and absolute value. So that's formally, that's just the subgradient of AX infinity norm. So Alice's goal is to find vectors which are orthogonal to A and then whenever she makes a query, the oracle will tell her, hey, there is this vector which you still have a large inner product with. Just the vector that you have the largest inner product with. So Alice uh, can look at, uh, she gets, makes a query x1, gets a response, say g1. She can look at the query and the response and this message, make another query x2, gets another response. She can keep doing this m times, that's a number of queries. She makes these m queries, she gets these responses. And then the oracle goes away. So now Alice is left with this message that she wrote down in the beginning and she's, these, these queries and the responses. And her goal is to think and then eventually come up with k vectors y1 through yk, which have the property that they are roughly orthogonal to a. So ax ln infinity norm is sufficiently, sorry, ay infinity norm is sufficiently small. y1 through yk are the vectors returned. And these vectors should span a robust linear independence condition. So this means that yi should not have a very large component in the span of y1 through yi minus one. They should robustly span a high dimensional subspace. So that's the game. We relate winning this game to optimizing this hard function class. So we want to say that any successful algorithm for minimizing this class of functions can be used to win the game. So uh, there's an optimization oracle, optimization algorithm. The algorithm interacts with an optimization oracle. So we want to say that uh, any successful optimization algorithm can be used in order to win the game in a regime which should not be possible. So we'll show a lower bound for this game at the end. So uh, anything which, uh, which is very successful at optimizing this, so with small memory or with a small number of queries, will violate the lower bound for this game. So in the communication game, can yeah. Alice update the M? No, M is always, M is something that she can write, but she always has M and there's no memory restriction after this initial compression. After this, she can do whatever she likes. So she can look at the pre responses, the queries, and she can make whatever queries. So there's no memory limitation after this. So she doesn't have to update it. Yeah, she does no need to update it. Okay, so, uh, so what we really, what we show is that we can simulate uh, the optimization oracle using this game oracle. So you want to say that the algorithm can be used to win the game. And uh, the ma matrix A in the game will correspond to this matrix A in our hard function class. And this Nemirovsky function is something that we will sample on our own. This is something the algorithm thinks of. And then uh, whenever the algorithm makes a query, we have access to this oracle in the game which responds with this subgradient. And using this oracle, we can simulate an optimization oracle, a first order oracle for the function that we are trying to minimize. So we can do the simulation efficiently. So for any query, we can simulate the oracle, and that's how we say that if you have any algorithm for optimizing the function class, then you have an algorithm for winning the game. So last step then is to show a lower bound for the game. I won't go into this in too much detail, but essentially what we show is that the true trivial algorithms are all that are possible for this game. So what are the true trivial algorithms for this game? So Alice can always, like as I said before, if she has dk memory, then she can just write down k vectors which are orthogonal to the rows of a in the beginning. So dk memory is trivial. You don't need to make any queries. What's the other extreme? Suppose she doesn't have any memory. m is just zero. In that case, she can always just make d queries roughly, get all the rows of the matrix a. I guess there's only d over two rows, so probably like d over two queries. And with that, you just have all of the rows. You can find however many vectors you want in the kernel. So these two algorithms are the trivial endpoints. So you can always do it with dk memory, you can always do it with d queries. You show that essentially these two things are all that are possible. 
So if you make less than DK queries, then you must, so if you have less than DK memory, then you must make about D queries up to some constant factors in the number of queries. And we show this via an information theoretic framework, uh, which uh, I think like, yeah, it's fairly intuitive, which I won't go into in the talk though. So, uh, so that's all I'll talk about with the proof. So this is the lower bound that we show. And uh, then uh, some very interesting work has improved uh, the lower bound along certain regimes. So uh, now we know that actually 6R work showed, the, showed that D to the 1.25 memory was needed. Uh, there's work which shows that for any deterministic algorithm, D squared is needed. And uh, there's also work which shows that if you are looking at very small error epsilon, then for, even for a randomized algorithm, D squared is needed. For the error there is quasi-polynomially small. So at this point, now we know that these methods are Pareto optimal. So you cannot hope to get the optimal query complexity unless you actually use D squared memory. Yeah. I, I think I have a silly question. I'm just no. a little confused. But so, so for in your hard function class, I mean, what is really the difference between your AX infinity and the Mirovsky function? Can you write the AX infinity as a Mirovsky function? Um, so if you look at this, yeah, this hard function class, so we are, uh, I guess they, you get thinking of dividing them into two parts, like this part like prevents you from in getting information from this part unless you are sufficiently orthogonal to it. They're all piecewise linear functions, which is, I think is what you're thinking of. Yeah, but I think it, it could be just done as the same function because you can construct the information theoretical or bound using these uh, rather macro vectors, which you end up using anyway. So, so then I'm just trying to, to get the intuition. So the information theoretic arguments, they essentially establish, so, so you get these vectors that are near orthogonal, right? Yeah. So they're sub-Gaussian. So, and, and then they work by saying you need to learn all these uh, vectors to get to a certain error, right? So is the memory argument about actually constructing those queries that you need enough memory to... Uh, actually get the, 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 the new queries. Um, I'm, just, I'm just trying to get some intuition about so, that. So the intuition really is that, uh, like in terms of like why this is hard, it's really that what you want to say is that it's hard to find a large dimensional subspace within the kernel of any matrix if you're doing it with small memory. So like, and like both like these, like so like this part basically gets you like the fact that you want to be in the kernel of the matrix. This part tells you that you have to span a high dimensional subspace. So for example, in terms of the game, like uh, when you actually do the reduction, like this second part is actually something that we don't, uh, this, the oracle is not involved in this part. The algorithm just thinks of this function on its own. So uh, it's really like the, yeah, you need both of these constraints in order to make it work. Yeah, so, so, so then it is about constructing the queries, right? Because you're following like the information, the information theoretic argument is you need to uncover all of these. Yeah. And in your case, you, yeah. you eventually yeah. just to each of x. Yeah. And then after a point to even ask the appropriate query, you need enough memory to, to even construct those. Queries. Just by the cell, this is not hard. Just hx, we, we can't show memory lower bound for hx. We do, need, we do need this other part in order to show a memory lower bound. So if we just have the Nemirovsky function, there's no memory lower bound just for that function. But the first one is also kind of a Nemirovsky function. But it has, it has a different structure. So for example, here, like, we are scaling things such that you get a particular property. I see. So, so you're saying like the role of eta and... Rows. Yeah, we, are, we, are, we do have to scale things such that you get a particular... Just this by itself, there's no memory lower bound for that. But also, I guess, in the communication game, yeah. you're thinking of setting k to be something sublinear in D, right? Yeah. So the lower bound is a little bit stronger in terms of uh, the amount of information you're getting. Because if, every time you're getting a vector, yeah. so it's it's easy to show that you have to make at least k queries. Yeah, yeah. But showing that you actually need to make, make d queries. Query. And that's that's why, we, yeah, if you, it's easy for k, but you wouldn't get a lower, like any non-trivial lower bound separation for just k. So the main point is to show that you actually need to go all the way to d, basically see the entire matrix if you didn't, uh, you didn't have enough memory to begin with. So uh, just in terms of, uh, so we can ask, lots of natural questions here. One is to just see if we can actually get like this d squared lower bound for randomized algorithms for polynomially small error. 
think it would be very interesting to understand this for smooth functions. So this is just convex Lipschitz functions. Like the construction by itself doesn't really go through for smooth functions. Um, that it would be very interesting to understand if you have similar trade-offs there. Then uh, it would be very interesting to see if we can uh, show that you cannot improve on the rate, poly one over epsilon rate of gradient descent, particularly in the memory regime where you have a linear memory. So gradient descent takes like one over epsilon square. So if you're looking at very small epsilon, say quasi polynomially small epsilon, then that's a quasi polynomial number of queries. Within the class of say even linear memory algorithms, can you improve on that? We think that we cannot. We think that you cannot improve on this gradient descent convergence rate without using basically quadratic memory. Like based, uh, going back to this thing that I said before that in general, it seems like you can't really improve on the convergence rate of these known memory efficient techniques without using much more memory. Okay, uh, so that's the first part. Now talk about the second setting and I'll spend uh, less time on this. It's joint work with Aaron and Greg. So, here, so far we were working with access to a gradient oracle. In lots of ML settings, we don't actually work with the gradient oracle because that's too expensive. It's much easier to work with a stochastic gradient oracle where you just get access to random data points. You find the gradient with respect to that data point. The goal here will be to try to understand if there's a trade-off between how much memory you have and the number of samples that you need to see. The natural starting point is just look at a linear model here, um, a canonical optimization setting. So you just want to solve a linear system, but you're getting these data points one at a time in a streaming fashion. I just describe the setup with an example. I think that's the easiest. So everything is in two dimensions here. In general, you'll be in d dimensions. First time step, you get a vector a1, and you get the inner product of a1 with x, that's b1. Second time step, you get another vector, but the first vector goes away. So you'll only get one pass over this data stream. You cannot access a previous example again, unless you store it in memory. You can ask for as many examples you want. At the end of the day, your job is to solve the linear system. And we want to understand if there is, if that algorithm has less memory, so if it cannot store all the examples that it sees, then would it require to see more examples than what is strictly necessary information theoretically? Again, memory here would just be the number of bits again, and for now we just assume that all these samples are drawn from a standard Gaussian, so every coordinate is from standard Gaussian. Uh, so, so yeah. Just a quick clarification. So, uh, what is the actual query? So, you query x and you get both a and b? You get a, you, so you don't query x, you're just getting a random example a now. So, it's really the stochastic gradient oracle. So you, you, you get a random example a, where every coordinate is drawn from a Gaussian distribution, and then you get the inner part of A with uh, this unknown vector x, and your job is to find x. So what can we do here? Well, you can always do Gaussian elimination. Two dimensions, store two vectors, you're done. You have the answer. D dimensions, you need D examples, but you need D squared memory because you're storing D things in D dimensions. What if you wanted to solve this with less memory? You just go back to gradient descent again. De initialize. it takes a little bit more time, few more steps, will eventually converge to something quite close to the original answer. It needs more than D examples. In this particular case where you have samples from this nice Gaussian distribution, it needs D log one over epsilon, but this could be much worse if these samples were coming from a less benign distribution. I'll talk more about that later. For now, just think of this as requiring more samples, but it only requires about D memory. And as before, we want to understand if there's anything in between the two. So we have Gaussian elimination with D squared memory D examples, and D examples are necessary because you're solving a linear system in D dimensions. Gradient descent with D memory requires more samples. And uh, see, everything here is trivially achievable. So what can you do in between? So really because uh, these uh, linear systems are in some sense like the bedrock of convex optimization, this is an instantiation of a more general question you can ask about first order methods versus second order methods. So first order optimization method, they rely on doing a linear approximation of the function, and uh, they are much more efficient as we saw. In contrast, second order methods, they rely on doing a second order approximation, a quadratic approximation, but uh, so they can be much more expensive. Again, you'll need to store the second order information, the Hessian, which will require quadratic memory and so on. And they can get a faster convergence rate. So in this particular case, gradient descent is the first order method that you can do here. Gaussian elimination or just linear system solving, any algorithm you like, that'll be the second order method for this problem. It'll just converge in one step because it's actually a quadratic problem. And we want to understand if there's anything in between. So 
I'll describe uh, our result like, very informally now, because I want to spend a little bit more time just talking about uh, some other open questions. What we show is that uh, any subquadratic algorithm for this problem requires more data. So there's a region here again which is not achievable by any algorithm. So if you have any algorithm which uses even slightly subquadratic memory, then it must use much more samples. The actual separation that we show is that you need to use d log log 1 over epsilon samples, whereas the upper bound is d log 1 over epsilon. So there's a pretty big gap in terms of the upper bound and the lower bound. But this shows the separation between any quadratic memory algorithm and anything subquadratic, even by a constant factor. Okay, uh, so let me talk about this a little bit more, and that'll also be a segue into the next part. So I said before, for convex optimization, we have these first order techniques and these second order techniques. What we conjecture, again, in general, is that uh, if you have any algorithm that significantly improves on the convergence rate of these best known first order techniques, then uh, you must use a lot more memory, quadratic memory. So if you look, look, go back to this curve, we have first order methods on one point, at on one end, second order methods on the other end. It seems like, in general, there's nothing really in between the two. So there's no 1.5 order method in that sense. So if you have quadratic memory, then you can get the fast convergence rates that you do get. Anything less than that, all you can do is suffer from the convergence rate of uh, the first order method. So, so in that sense, like memory, it seems like might determine the best sample complexity that you can hope to achieve. So particular instantiation of this, which I think is very interesting, is to understand this for ill-conditioned systems. So Condition number of uh, any optimization problem is decides how well behaved the optimization problem is. I won't dis define this formally, but for a linear system, it just be the ratio of the largest to the smallest eigenvalue. And if this is very large, means that there are certain directions which are very flat, and you need to take a lot of steps if you do a first order method. So despite a lot of like very interesting algorithmic work, first order techniques for this problem, they all need a sample complexity, which depends polynomially on the condition number kappa. We think that this is gen in necessary in general. So we think that there is a class of linear systems which all have condition number kappa, such that any algorithm either requires d squared memory or needs to suffer from a sample complexity which depends polynomially on the condition number. So it seems like generally, again, there's this dichotomy that you either have to use quadratic memory or you must suffer from a sample complexity which depends on condition number. There's really nothing in between, like a pretty sharp transition in the algorithmic landscape. So you can think it's pretty interesting if this is uh, something like this is true, that you cannot improve on uh, the convergence rate of these memory uh, efficient techniques without using much more memory. Okay. Yeah, Jilan? I don't know really anything about it, but I remember reading at some point that there is something called a 1.5 derivative or fractional derivative. Do you, like, do, do you know what those are and whether they're, right, because first order methods use first derivatives, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. so, are fractional derivatives at all relevant? I don't know if they're useful for any of these optimization settings. I, I, I can't claim to know too much about them, but I don't think they get better rates uh, for any of these settings, as far as I know. Maybe some of you know better. Like something in between would be, you know, maybe you run in sub-exponential time in the co condition number? Yeah, like yeah. It's a little bit log k, but log kappa, but yeah. but you yeah. the 1.5 memory. But you do 1.5, something like that would be what I would call in between. Isn't we we have um, yeah I I don't know of anything in between we uh, we tried to think about it uh, yeah like the next part will be about some more algorithmic techniques which were inspired by trying to like break this but yeah we haven't really been able to uh, like break this conjecture in general so the product goal is to try to understand if uh, like what is possible efficiently is an optimization and again use trying to use memory as a lens to understand this. And in the last part, I'll talk about uh, how we can also get some up, new upper bounds, so some better convergence rates with small memory. This is joint work with John Kellner, Annie, Aaron, and Greg again, and Hong Wen Yuan. So trying to use some of these hard uh, settings to construct, uh, construct new settings where it's possible to circumvent the lower bounds and actually get some sort of best of both worlds. So our conjecture was that, uh, in general, for condition number kappa, you either require d squared memory or some condition number dependence. Show that with some structure, you can get a best of both worlds. So for some structured linear systems, you can get the polylog kappa sample complexity, 
but with only D-memory. This is also true beyond linear systems with, and holds for a class of multi-scale optimization problems that we defined. I won't get into that. I'll just talk about the linear setting because I think that's the easiest way to explain the intuition. So even consider the, uh, the setting where the linear system has only two unique eigenvalues. So eigenvalues at one and eigenvalues at one over kappa. So condition number is kappa. Think of kappa as being very large. So this can be very ill condition, like these small directions, these eigenvalues, the eigenvectors are along these small directions, you'll have like very flat landscape. So the safest choice will be to uh, take a step size of about one, um, it's based on like the, the Lipschitz constant here. So the problem there is that you would need to take about kappa steps in order to make progress along these small directions, just because the landscape is so flat. So you'd be very slow along these small directions. An aggressive choice would be, take, uh, would be to take a much larger step size. You could take a step size of kappa, which would be great for these small directions, but it would blow things up along the larger eigen directions. So the algorithmic solution we propose is to just follow a large step with a bunch of smaller steps. So we call this algorithm big step, little step, and just does what I said before, and that's what the name suggests. So the result is that for some structured linear systems, there is a recursive sequence of large and small steps, which uh, solves the problem with the polylog kappa condition number uh, dependence, and uh, only order D memory. So what the sequence of step sizes look like uh, is something like this. So it has this recursive structure, looks like a cyclic step size uh, sequence, which people do use in ML settings as well, and it should be has a nice paper on trying to understand some of that effect too. I'm happy to talk more about this offline if you want. So does this, uh... Schedule depends on the spectrum of the... Yes, so we do, like, you need to know the condition number to begin with. So what we do is just do a grid search. So it doesn't change the complexity, but in practice that would be horrible. So I think like something like a conjugate, uh, like nonlinear CG or something like that, like for, no, uh, for general co uh, convex optimization problems, or just CG for quadratic problems should also basically get this rate, I think, without needing to choose the step size in advance, but we don't know how to show that. So do you only need to know kappa or the entire spectrum? You need to know like the, the entire spectrum, so, but you can do a grid search over that because there's only a small number of unique eigenvalues. But you don't need to know the eigenvectors, that's the advantage. Yeah, yeah, that's the advantage, yeah. Okay, great. So in like the last like three, four minutes or so, I want to talk about uh, a very different viewpoint on computational statistical gaps. So I'm going to try to use some of this understanding to, under to see what uh, deep learning models learn. And uh, you know, I'll talk about this very briefly. I won't really talk about results, but I think the philosophy may be interesting uh, to some of you if you're interested in computational statistical gaps. This is a joint work with uh, Dei Ching Fu, Tian Chi Chen, and Robin Jia. The goal is to understand how transformers do linear regression. So it'll seem very different, but then we'll go back to computational statistical gaps. So the setting here is that you just have a bunch of examples coming from a linear system, and the transformer needs to make a prediction for the next example. Transformers do very well on this, and the question is how do they actually solve this? So there's uh, prior work, some interesting papers which say that uh, they do something like gradient descent implicitly. And uh, what we show actually is that they're doing something much more interesting in some sense. They seem to be doing like a second order method. But the main takeaway, at least from our standpoint today, is just uh, the methodology involved. So the methodology involves something which I'll call applied theory. So essentially trying to use understanding of information and computational gaps to devise settings so that we can understand what is happening internally in these algorithms. Just two high level claims. The first claim is that uh, we can use statistical and computational gaps and information theoretic lower bounds to understand internal mechanisms. Two, the available memory that the algorithms have may explain differences in behavior between different architectures. Just explain each of this in one slide, and I'm happy to talk about this more offline if you want. So the first thing is, uh, so we claim that you can use uh, information theoretic and computational lower bounds to understand what might be happening internally. So in this particular case, we wanted to understand how transformers do linear regression. So they could be doing something first order, like a gradient descent, or they could be doing something second order. And uh, most of the ex existing empirical work on understanding transformers, will usually use some kind of uh, a more microscopic lens to try to invert what the weights are doing and try to understand what might be happening. But that can be very hard because these models are very large and hugely overparameterized. 
In contrast, I think trying to use a more information theoretic and computational lens, and just looking at the input-output behavior could still say a lot about what must be happening internally. So in this particular case, for example, we can argue that transformers cannot be doing anything first order, let alone gradient descent, just based on the rate of convergence that we see. And uh, we can also devise settings where the gap between first and second order methods is larger. So these are the ill-conditioned settings that I talked about just a while ago. And uh, again, then to demonstrate that the, for transformers, they don't really seem to be suffering from any condition number dependencies, whereas first order methods do suffer. And that might be provably necessary if you think that that's hard, if those problems are hard to solve with small memory uh, with using any first order technique. And second, uh, like it seems like the, maybe the memory could explain differences between architecture. So on the one hand, we have transformers. I, obviously, yes, Sitan talked about what these do, but I won't really get into that. You also have different architectures. We have these recurrent architectures, things like LSTMs. Again, I won't talk about what happens internally, but the main difference from our point of view is just that they process these examples one at a time. In contrast, transformers, you have the entire sequence available to you in context, and you can do something with this. You can process all of these examples together. And just the fact that they have to process things one at, uh, one at a time, like these recurrent architectures, seems to limit what they can do. So what we see is that transformers seem to prefer doing a second order method for this problem. Whereas a recurrent architecture like LSTM, they seem to be much more like a first order method. So perhaps the underlying the memory or the information available to them could explain how, what algorithms that they actually learn from data. Okay, uh, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Just to summarize, so talked about how memory can be a fundamental computational resource and memory considerations are, can be crucial in practice. We wanted to understand the role of memory in learning and optimization and if sees there are trade-offs. We saw some instantiation of this uh, that might, be not, might not be possible to significantly improve on the convergence rate or some of these known memory efficient techniques without using much more memory first for, for first order setting or a stochastic, uh, a stochastic setting. Seems that memory may determine the best convergence rate that you can hope to get and allow us to prove a pretty simple unconditional separation between simple and complex techniques. Something like this would be very hard for running time, but it's like understanding memory is perhaps much more information theoretic and something that we can get to the bottom of. It also suggests new problem structures where we can circumvent some of these lower bounds and design some new variants of GD, and also maybe understand what happens in more complex models. Happy to talk any, about any of this more offline. Thank you so much for listening.